And we do look forward to a dear friend and a Coptic fellowship member and a integral part of the organization. Alan Toddy steps up again with another hour of wisdom, I'd like to call it. And uh, Alan continues to develop new and better ways to manifest your desires reliably and consistently. He walks his path with humility as a photographer, author, speaker, coach, and marketing consultant. He's also a lover, explorer, artist, wanderer, mystical, deep, and complex gentleman. And Alan recognizes that we're all divine beings, and most of what he does is intended to help you express the full potential of the divine spark within you through his writing, photography, business consulting, and personal development. In January 2003, Alan started writing books and creating audio programs to help people tap into the divine nature within themselves in order to direct the course of their lives to attain whatever goals they may have. He has written two books on, and are available on Amazon.com, Choose to Believe, A Practical Guide to Living Your Dreams, and Harmonic Prayer, How to Increasingly, Instantly Increase Your Prayer Power. Harmonic Prayer is available as an email course and is available on his website, powerkeyspublishing.com. And uh, we can put that on the, the chat link too. Nice presentation. I'm looking forward to which direction this one might go. It's traditional folk magic for modern times with Alan. He'll present that in just a moment. Thanks everyone for coming in tonight. Uh, this is going to be a very different presentation than anything that I've done before. Um, the, the basic idea here is that over the years, and I've probably been presenting for the Coptics close to 10 years, because 10 years ago was when I wrote my book, Harmonic Prayer, and that was the first topic that I talked about. And the concept that I have been talking about for these 10 years is that our minds are directly connected with the divine mind, the creator of the universe. And through that connection, we have, as Linda just said, infinite power to create. And the only things we need, the only things that we need in order to create are things that are within ourselves. We need faith. Faith is the number one most important thing. We need to be able to focus our mind on the thing that we want to create. And there's a feeling aspect involved in there as well. And I've been talking about this over and over and over and over again. And from time to time, the topic of other things have come up like crystals or candles or oils or incense. And I have made the comment on a number of occasions that we don't need any of these things. And I got the feeling that maybe I have communicated my intention not as clearly as I would like to have communicated because I'm not against any of these things. And as, as you see here, I've got a collection of all sorts of crystals, candles, incense, oils, and, and all sorts of different things. In fact, I even brought in my, my crystal rod that I picked up at a Renaissance fair a few years ago. Uh, <laughs> I am very much into crystals. I am very much into candles. I'm very much into incense. I love these things. But you know what? I'm about ready to jump to the end of my presentation. And I don't want to do that. Tonight is completely unscripted. I don't even have an outline. I have a basic idea of what I want to cover, and that's about it. So let's start at the beginning because I do want to kind of share some of my pathway with you and let you know what my experiences have been with some of these extra things and why I've come to the conclusion that I've come to. And my journey starts, I've, I've mentioned this on a couple of talks, my journey starts back in, in middle school, uh, junior high school. And at that time, I was really into ghost stories. Uh, every time we went to the school library, I would look for a new story new fiction book to read to entertain myself for the week. And one particular week I went into the library and I'm looking in the card catalog. If anybody ever remembers what those used to be, I'd go into the card catalog looking for ghost stories. And I found a reference to a book that was not in the fiction section. It was in the nonfiction section of the library. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, this stuff could actually be true. And so I go over to that area of the library, the 133 section of the library, 
and I'm finding all sorts of books that look really, really interesting. And one book in particular really caught my attention. It's this book, Star Spells, Secrets, and Sorcery. And I checked that book out, read it, went back the next week, checked it out again, continued to read it, checked it out again, checked it out again, checked it out again. I had that book for at least two months. And this was at the end of the school year. And my birthday is at the end of May. So end of school year, birthday time. Uh, that particular year, my mom asked me if I had any special requests as a birthday present. I said, I want a copy of this book. Guess what? This is the copy that she gave me that year. I still have it. Um, it's a very interesting book, especially for someone in a, in a junior high, middle school area, because it was a sampler package. It was a brief introduction into all sorts of things metaphysical. Uh, the thing that I really got into the most at that time was about astrology. But astrology was just one aspect of it. There was numerology. There was the tarot deck. There was uh, divination with dice, with reading tea leaves, palmistry. There was a little bit of that. Uh, there was a section on what they called, what is it, uh, bibliomancy where you basically just close your eyes, you grab a book, you open the book and let your finger find a, find a spot on the page and then you read what your finger is pointing to as the answer to your question. And that, that actually can work quite well. It's, it's amazing what some of the answers can come out from that, the, that process. But um, like I said, I've I've definitely gotten into the oils. I mean, this is just a small collection of little oils that I bought when I was in Kansas City. Uh, actually, let's see, I think I've got, yep, in my pocket, I've got the oil that I use most these days, which is a myrrh oil. I really like this one. Uh, and the thing that I found with the oils, it's, it's like Linda was talking about with the Coptic moment, it's a symbol. It's a way of reminding yourself to think in a certain way. And for me, when I smell this myrrh oil, I'm remembering what the myrrh oil symbolizes, what it is, what it represents, what it is associated with, which is the opening of the psychic senses. And so for me, whenever I smell that, that smell of myrrh, I am reminded that I am connected to the divine mind and I am open to that divine wisdom and I can allow that divine wisdom to guide me in my everyday life. So that's one of the th reasons why I really like continuing to use that myrrh oil. Uh, the, the incenses, the incense that I really like the most is what they call dragon's blood. It's um, a product from a certain type of tree. It's, it's dried sap. And I'm not exactly sure what the tree is that it's made from, but it has a smell that really is sharp. It's pungent. It's very. It's a very strong smell. And back at the time when I was learning about the incenses, it it was more of a thing of the name really attracted me more than anything else. Dragon's blood. Dragons represent power. They represent magic. They represent um, a huge amount of of possibilities. And so whenever I burnt that dragon's blood, it's like, okay, things are going to happen. Things are really going to happen. And it cleared out all of the negativity that I was experiencing at whatever time that I decided to burn it. Um, as far as dragons, you, you, there's the little dragon here that I keep with me. Uh, the bumper sticker, Mike mentioned he saw bumper stickers. Uh, you may not be able to read that. It says, do not meddle in the affairs of dragons, for you are crunchy and good with ketchup. <laughs> um, you got to have fun with all this stuff. And that's really the bottom line with a lot of uh, metaphysics is that no matter what we're doing to make contact with the divine, to try to channel our intentions to the divine mind so that they can manifest, it's important to have fun because one of the worst mistakes that I ever made was to approach manifesting, approach this whole spiritual endeavor as if it were work. 
And when I was serious about it, when I was trying to push through all the obstacles, trying to push through obstacles creates obstacles. It's a matter of what Christ kept saying, according to your faith, is it done to you? If I believed in obstacles, I was creating an obstacle. So you've got to have fun. You've got to relax. You've got to let loose and just have fun with all this stuff. Because when we're playing, everything flows so much easier. So I'm getting off of where I was. So let's see, before I got into all of those, I learned about Buckeyes. Buckeyes are supposed to be good luck pieces. They're a little thing off of a tree. And I used to carry one in my pocket quite often. And every time I'd lose one, I'd go find another one. And so Buckeyes were something that I would carry in a pocket for good luck. Uh, some people carry rabbit's feet or four leaves clovers. I was into the Buckeyes. Um, all sorts of different things. Horseshoes. You hang a horseshoe over a doorway. That's supposed to create good luck. And according to some traditions, and here's a very important point that I want to cover tonight, is that different traditions give you different rules for how to do it. For instance, with the horseshoe, uh, some, some people say that you just have to hang it above the door. Some people say you got to hang it to the side of the door. Some people say that in order for it to be good luck, you have to touch it as you go through the door. Some people say it's got to be pointed up. Other people say it's got to be pointed down. Uh, there's all the different rules for how a horseshoe is supposed to be good luck. Now, if it really did depend on any of those factors, don't you think that everyone would be following the same rules? The fact that there's so many different rules indicate that maybe those rules are not really all that important. It's just a matter of what do you believe? And again, according to your belief, will it be done unto you? If you believe that hanging a horseshoe in a particular way will be good luck, then it will be good luck for you. So that's kind of where everything got started. Uh, let's see, another thing that I wanted to share, when I ended up in Kansas City, this is... Uh, Actually, let's see. Yep, this is after I found the Joseph Murphy. I ended up connecting in with a group of American Buddhists, the Soko yeah. Soku Gokai of America. And there was this whole thing about chanting. And the Nam Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. 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 And the idea is that as you're chanting these words that represent the Spirit of God, you are channeling God energy. And what this particular group believed in was that as, as you chanted with the prayer beads and focused on the thing that you wanted to manifest, that thing would manifest. And there were all sorts of people in that group telling stories about what they manifested using this chanting process. I, I remember one guy saying that he chanted for, uh, actually it was a bag of weed. It was uh, some kind of drugs. And he said he got this great big, huge bag of the premium stuff and it was wonderful. And of course, whatever, that was his thing, not mine. <laughs> so we can manifest anything we want to. That's another little point that side point in all of this. Uh, let's see here. I was into developing psychic abilities for a long while, trying to open up my mind to read other minds, to communicate the channel, the, the power of God. This book was another sampler book that really caught my attention for a while. Uh, the, the author of this book was really just taking samples from a lot of other books. And there were some very interesting things. Uh, this Actually, all four of these books I was introduced to through that one book. Uh, one of these books, let's see, this one, New Avatar Power. As you can see, it's really, really old. That book talks about something that you guys may have heard of called the Middle Pillar. And this is something from the Kabbalah something from the ancient Jewish tra tradition that is associated with what's known as the tree of life, which incidentally, the tree of life is also very closely connected with the tarot. Uh, 
I don't want to get into too many details, but there's a lot of associations between these different things. And it's a lot of symbology where if you work with the symbols, you are communicating an idea to your deeper mind to respond in a certain way. And the idea of the middle pillar is that we sit in meditation and we start thinking of the different chakras. And there's the root chakra at the base of the spine. We think of that and we think of that as a red color. We think of it swirling in a particular direction, maybe having a particular shape. And then when we had that firmly in our mind, then we visualize the next chakra up, the spleen chakra. The second one, we visualize that in the color of orange. And it just goes up from the rainbow, the spleen chakra, the solar plexus chakra as yellow, the heart chakra is green, the throat chakra is blue, the pineal gland as a purple, and then the crown chakra, usually it's a golden, golden white color. And so we visualize these different chakras with different colors, different shapes, spinning and moving in different ways. And all of that detail is kept in mind at the same time, which in my experience, when I did that, that was one exercise that really made a big difference for me because it cleared out all of the resistance in my mind. In order to keep all those details in my mind at one time, I had to let go of a whole lot of stuff. I had to let go of thinking about why things weren't working in my life. I had to let go of thinking about, okay, I've got to go out and find a job sometime over the next week or two or else I'm out of my apartment. I had to let go of a lot of things. And then when I was able to clear my mind and focus on these things, and again, focus is one of the things that I talk about because it does make a big difference in our effectiveness in manifesting. When I was able to focus and clear everything out, things just worked so much better for the next several days after that. So that was one meditation exercise that made a big, big difference for me. Uh, let's see, some of the other things I've gotten into, uh, Ceremonial Magic. This is a book that I bought just to have on my bookcase as a reference. Uh, I haven't yet read it. <laughs> I've got a few books like that. Uh, let's see, Tarot. I was definitely into Tarot. I did readings with that. Um, in fact, as, as I mentioned to some pe people, I've done so many different things studied so many different traditions, uh, the crystals, uh, the ESP, mind power. One, another one of the books that really made a big difference for me, written in the 1800s, William Walker Atkinson, and the book is called Mind Power. You can get all of his books on, on Amazon as a Kindle ebook for like 10 bucks. Get everything he's ever written and it's a lot of material. It's a lot of good material. So let's see, where's my timing at? Okay, yep, I'm about halfway here. So uh, crystals, yes, I am very much into the crystals. I have bought so many different crystals. I have my own medicine bag worth of crystals. There's all sorts of little goodies in there. Uh, in fact, as far as the crystals go, let me set something up here so you guys can see it a little bit better. Who? What psychic is worth anything without a crystal ball? I got into all of it. I got into all of it very heavy. Uh, Chris, let's see, crystal bracelet, uh, the tourmaline stones. These I really like to carry with me because supposedly they had a higher energy than even quartz. And so I would hold it in my hand. I would focus and I would really absorb that energy. I would let the crystal filter my energy and tune it to a higher vibration. And so that was my experience with crystals. There's a lot of different things that crystals can do for you. At one particular point, I remember reading about making crystal rods, basically your own magic wand. And so I found a good crystal. I bought some brass pipe. I cut it. I fit it and I wrapped it with what was supposed to be an insulator material. It was a sports tape for rackets and things like that, but it was good enough. I mean, it was cheap, and this is a point when I did this when I was next to homeless. 
I mean, I really didn't have a whole lot going for me, but I did focus enough on what I was doing to try to make this. And of course, the idea is that the insulator works with the energy of your body to create energy in the chamber, which can then be directed through the crystal and you make your symbols, you do all sorts of different things with it, and you can direct the energy where you want it to go. So that was the idea behind there. I did play with it quite a bit. Can't really say I got a whole lot of results from that. Uh, later, I did buy something that was a little bit more well-made by somebody else. Uh, the leather, I think, was actually a nice touch on this one. Very clear crystal on there. Uh, Linda bought me one at one point. It's got glass on there. It's got all sorts of little stones along the way. Uh, I like the idea of that, so that's kind of fun to play with. Um, that's probably enough with the crystals. So let's see where where else can we go? Oh, uh, there's also this idea out there that in order to manifest something, you have to visualize it and if you can find a picture of what you want okay this is a jaguar that i was wanting to visualize and manifest at one point in time i can't remember how long ago that was it's got to be at least 20 25 years ago but i would hang this up and i would sit and i would visualize and i'd visualize and i'd focus on it and i'd focus on it it's like that's mine that's mine that's mine that's mine that's mine that's mine hasn't yet manifested i'm still waiting for that one <laughs> okay so as far as visualizing things there's also the idea of uh, the fake money sometimes that's pretty good uh, these are million dollar bills that I've handed out on a couple of occasions but what's even better is when you've got real money uh, one of my customers online sent me a 10 euro note as a payment for something that he bought online I kept it uh, when we came back from Egypt. I kept some of that money. Uh, and then there's this little thing. Um, I actually had to go looking for this because it wasn't just where I thought it was. This is a $10 billion note from the, from the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. It was actually legal tender when it was printed. So $10 billion sitting around. I mean, come on, you've got to be rich if you can have $10 billion sitting around. All, right? So visualizing, having an idea in your mind. This is what all of these things are good for because they, they are useful to remind yourself of an idea. They're useful for associating yourself with an idea, with a concept that you would like to manifest. Um, the, the candles, the incense, the oils, all of that, it communicates to your brain through your nose, through your eyes, through, through different channels so that it's not just words. It's not just pictures inside your mind. It's something physical, which if you've got something physical that you're working with as, um, let's see, Max Freedom Long, that was another book I was going to bring out. Max Freedom Lung, The Secret Science Behind Miracles. Um, this was also a very powerful book for me. So the physicality of a process through which you manifest a desired objective helps to communicate that idea to your subconscious mind. And it's through your subconscious mind that we are connected to the divine mind, the superconscious mind. And by communicating our desires to that superconscious mind, that is where our manifestations come from. So I guess the bottom line that I really want to communicate in this is that all of these things are okay. All of these things can work if you believe in them. A lot of these things didn't work for me because at the time I didn't believe in them. Sometimes they worked, sometimes they didn't. When I was going through all this, I kept notes. I kept journals. And I would write down what I was trying to do, how I was doing it, what process I used, how I felt at that time, and whatever results that I experienced within the week or two after that point. 
And so by keeping those notes, I was able to identify that all of these things, the crystals, the candles, all of it, it worked when I believed in it. When I didn't believe in it, it didn't work. And what I found since all of this, since finding that book in the bookstore that turned everything around for me, that let me realize that the power of creating miracles was already within me. And all I had to do was just believe in that power, communicate to that power, imagine what I wanted, and trust that it would happen. The experiences that I've had since focusing on this one idea have more than matched anything that I experienced using any of the tools. The tools are fine. The tools are fun. The tools can help you focus on what you want. But the power that makes them work comes from within. The power that makes all of these things perform magic or attract certain things into your experience, the power is within you. The power is in your beliefs. If you believe that focusing on money will attract money into your life, it will. If you believe that having a crystal of a particular type will give you a particular type of energy, it will. I mean, I've, I've, I've worn crystals as pendants. The citrine, good for communication. Amethyst, good for uh, spirituality. There's other types of symbols that I've used throughout time. Again, they're all good. They all help you focus on what you want, and they all work according to your belief in them. When you believe that these things work, they do. If you have trouble believing in these things, don't bother with it. The process that I've been teaching over the last 10 years, the harmonic prayer process, relax, go within yourself, imagine the thing that you would like to experience in rich, vivid detail, and then choose to trust that it will actually happen. This is the most direct, simplest approach to manifesting. It's not the only way. You can use any of the tools that you want to manifest if that's what you, if that's what you enjoy doing. I'm not against any of these things, but I do want everyone to understand that the power is within you, not the tools. So that's all I'm going to go with tonight. Thank you. I'm open to any questions you might have. Alan, can you hear me? Okay, did my... Hang on. Alan, this is Bill. Can you hear me? There we go. Now I can hear. My, my headphone had gotten unplugged, so I wasn't hearing anybody. <laughs> Alan, this is Bill. Hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. Let me ask you a quick question. <clears throat> sure. I noticed, I noticed that uh, you wear the onk around your neck. Can you say a word or two about the onk and how that uh, is important to you? Yeah. When we went to Egypt in 2016, that was the most amazing trip I had ever had for a couple of different reasons. First of all, I had always been fascinated by the ancient Egyptian culture. And so being in that place was meaningful in that respect. It was also an important trip because of the group that I was part of. John Davis led the group. It was a lot of Coptic people, a lot of fun people. So it was a great experience in that way as well. Uh, the Ankh itself was a symbol that seemed to be used quite often. It's called the key of life. And for me, that seemed to be, that's that connection to the divine through which we can get more life energy. And so for me, it represents extended life. It, ex it represents more energy. It represents a close connection with the divine. It also represents that trip and the fact that I can have amazing experiences like that trip over and over and over again. So that's, that's the symbology for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. In the lesson of symbology that I read by Comet Bay, I did not include all the 
the ancient Egyptian symbols, but the Ankh means eternal life, according to Hamid Bey. Sorry. Uh, I was just going to say, I've also found that important in, to me as well. The Ankh being uh, something that I've uh, been very close to for a number of years. Thank you. It's a powerful symbol, yes. So, Lori, you were going to say something? Yes, I wanted to thank you, Alan, just for the great reminder that we create through our minds whatever it is we want. And it doesn't matter what, I don't know, symbol or whatever you use. It's it's our thoughts that does the work. <laughs> right, so right. And, it's very, and the tools, very good. the symbols, they help to encapsulate ideas as 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 what we were just talking about with the Ankh, it's one symbol that can represent a couple different things. And so just by wearing the symbol, by feeling it around my neck, by seeing it in a mirror whenever I, whenever I am in front of a mirror, it reminds me of not just one thing, but several things. So symbols are great to encapsulate many different ideas or larger ideas into one thing. Where's the wizard's robe you promised me you were going to wear? <laughs> I didn't say, I didn't promise. I said I was thinking about it. And when you were doing the Coptic moment, I went in and I looked at it and I thought, you know what? I have a choice. I could come in with the wizard robe and actually make a little bit more of a flamboyant thing. But the other thing that I was going to talk about, which I didn't actually do, is the concept of the lucky shirt. A shirt that, well, it's, 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 part of the whole symbology thing. Uh, we get into these belief patterns that certain things are lucky, certain things are unlucky. I talked about the Buckeye and four leaf clovers and that type of thing. But a lot of people also get into this thing about whatever clothes they happen to be wearing when something good happens, somehow takes on this magical property that will create more good things whenever they wear it. I mean, sports fans are are notorious for this type of thing where they'll wear a certain shirt every time they go uh, to a game so that their team has, has a winning streak. Or uh, they may decide, okay, I'm not going to cut my hair just to make sure that streak keeps going. Or they might not take a shower and t whatever. I mean, <laughs> whatever their thing is, if if it's just on a streak, let's keep things going. Yeah, there's there's Mike with his thing. Uh, which I was kind of also kind of hinting with that too, symbology, um, keeping things going and, and streaks and luck. What's, what's lucky, what's unlucky. Walking under a ladder is another example that I thought about talking about. Where do some of these ideas come from? Some of these ideas come from the same way that any other superstition starts coming out. Uh, as a classic example, the idea of walking under a ladder is bad luck. That most likely came out because somebody walked under a ladder and then later in that day had a series of bad luck experiences. And then so the first time it's like, ah, it's probably nothing, it's probably nothing. But the second time they walk under a ladder again and then other bad things happen. It's like, you know what? Maybe there's a connection. And so they start talking about that connection to somebody else, and then they have a similar experience. And then someone else has a similar experience, and then they're all talking with each other. And it's like, you know what? We have to remember this. Do not walk under a ladder because it's bad luck. And that's where a lot of superstitions get their start. The whole idea of a four-leaf clover started out as a superstition. Uh, a lot of these systems of magic, I mean, the idea of crystals... Someone gets an idea, has an imagination that says, okay, you know what? I see light dancing around in there. There's some kind of life in here. And they start to wonder, does it have its own energy? Does it have its own life? And that thinking process, again, whatever we focus on and whatever we have enough of a belief to say it's a possibility, and if there's some kind of feeling aspect associated with there, that manifests an experience. And so when we think of something and we imagine something and we start to hypothesize about something, maybe this can happen. Maybe there's something to this. Then we start seeing connections that may not have been seen any other way. And so 
the idea of prayer beads probably started out in a similar way. The, the idea of facing east when you pray in, in certain religions. You face east before you pray because that's, that's the way it's done. All of these little rules are part of the thing like the, the horseshoe. You've got certain rules about how it's supposed to be done. And that is one of the key factors that I have found that when people start talking about rules, about how you have to do certain things in order to relate to the spiritual level and, and be able to manifest things that you want, whenever they say, well, you have to do this and then you have to do that and then you have to do that and you have to do this this way, Whenever they start talking about the rules, I know it's all about superstition, and that's not the way all this works. There's no rules. There's no rules. You can do it any which way you want to, as long as you can get to a point of, I believe that this will happen. I believe that this will work. Anything that gets you to that point will work. Because, as Christ said, according to your belief, is it done to you? If you believe that you will be healthy, then your belief will make you healthy. doesn't matter what you're eating, what you're drinking. I remember listening to a YouTube video just a couple of days ago. Neville Goddard was talking about travel. Somebody he talked, somebody he knew had traveled to a country, Nepal, I think it was, or somewhere in that general area. And what came back, what came out of that was that there were so many people who had lived well past the year of 100, 120, 135, 150, and they were not eating healthy. They were not living according to what Western medicine says is the healthy way to live. They were smoking, they were drinking, they were eating fats and meat and all sorts of different things, but they were still living to a very, very old age. And the thing that really came out of that was just they were peaceful within themselves. They lived in a peaceful way. And that was what helped them live so much longer. It wasn't about the rules. It wasn't about eating a certain way. It wasn't about smoking or not smoking. It wasn't about any of that stuff. It was all about how, how they felt within themselves and what you believe. That's what makes it all work. Yeah, Paula, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say how much I have enjoyed your talk today. It just was um, so interesting to listen to. Um, I've come to the same conclusion that you have. I think, um, but I do find that the certain things, for example, the crystals, I just find they're comforting to me if I'm going through a challenge time. Uh, even though I realize that the... Um, the solution to the problem and the and the energy is not in the yeah. rock. It's it's right. the faith. The faith is really the thing. And I think I've always treated it as an experiment about the the faith part. I you know if I'm in a challenge, I say to myself, "Okay, Paula, are you really going to give lip service to this, or are you really going to have faith?" that all things are in divine order and you will be guided in what you should do. And every time I have treated it as an experiment and I have indeed had the faith and the trust, it always does work, work out. So mm -hmm. anyway, great talk. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. I was glad to see that somebody else enjoys crystals and... <laughs> And candles and <laughs> sets, <laughs> aromas. Yeah, every, every, every once in a while, I have to let these guys out of the bag and, and let them get some fresh air. Um, I mean, there's so many of them. Let's see here. And that's just about half. I can't fit them all in my hand. But, yeah, I've got some really nice, nice ones in here. Uh, things that I really enjoy the looks of. I enjoy the feeling of them. And at one time, back in the whole thing about developing psychic abilities, I was focused on trying to read energies. And one of the early experiments with that 
was just sitting in a room, closing my eyes and just imagining that I could feel the energy of every item in the room. Like the desk here has an energy. The monitors have an energy. The camera has an energy. The microphone up here has an energy. The door has an energy. And I would be feeling the energies of all the different items to try to open up those psychic senses so that I can perceive things without my physical senses. And that was one of the early experiments that I did, uh, exercises, that type of thing. And that developed to a point where I could pick up a stone and I would clear my mind. And that's the, that's the big thing with that is you've got to clear your own energy out of the way so you can read the energy of the thing that you're trying to read. And then I would let my energy intermingle with the energy of the stone and I would notice how my energy changed. And then that told me what the energy of the stone was and what the energy of the stone could do. And so, I mean, just a tidbit of information, I guess. But yeah, all these things do have their own energy. They do have their own life. They do have their own existence. Um, and sometimes just like people, it's fun to just associate yourself to have a relationship with these little forms of energy. And you can take it in your hand. You can say, yep, yep. I remember you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're part of my life. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, tonight you guys have seen a very different side of me. Um, this is the playful side that doesn't always come out in these presentations. I'm usually a little bit more serious, but you do have to have fun every once in a while. And it's perfectly okay to have fun with all of these toys. Um, just, just, I just want you to understand that it's not the toys that have the power. The toys are just symbols. And the power is within you. So if we burn a candle to clear out negative energy or we burn incense to send one energy away and bring another energy in, it's not the incense that's sending out energy or putting pulling in energy. It's our thoughts. It's our thoughts. It's our feelings. It's our beliefs. That's what's doing it. The, the incense, the oils, the crystals, all of that. They're merely symbols to help us focus our minds, to spark our imaginations. Thank you, Tut. I, or Tut. I have a friend <laughs> that his name is Tuttle, and they call him Tut. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. That was wonderful. I really appreciated the, the talk this evening. You're very welcome, Connie. Thank you. And thank you, Alan, for sharing your smorgasbord of tools <laughs> to find yourself and go within. And uh, it was a nice reminder of that. Yeah. I use the pendulum myself, and that, that's, that's a nice way to feel that energy. And crystals, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thanks for letting them out of the, the bag and getting a breath <laughs> of fresh air and sharing it with all of us. Mm -hmm.